Welcome to the annual Sammy Shah Gets Schooled event. My name's Jeannie Ray and I'm the Senior Project Manager for Planetary Health at Victoria University. I'm very pleased to be introducing tonight's debate. To begin, on behalf of everyone here, I acknowledge the ancestors, elders and families of the Buruwurrung, the Woiwurrung and the Wathiwurrung, peoples of the Kulin, who are the traditional owners on the land we're filming on today. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend our respect to Aboriginal people watching this video. This is the third time we've held a debate between Sammy Shah and students from Footscray, but we have a couple of firsts. This is the first time we've held this event since the amalgamation of Gilmore College for Girls and Footscray City College to become Footscray High School. And we've never filmed or live streamed this event before. The team's been planning this remotely for a number of months and we're incredibly happy to come together on your screen for this exciting debate. We wish, of course, we could have a live audience and we thank you so much for joining us online. I really encourage you, though, to get involved throughout the live stream to support Sammy and the students and pitch into the debate yourself. There will be lots to talk about. This event is proudly sponsored by Victoria University and Maribyrnong City Council as part of the Victoria University Town Initiative. This is Footscray Learning Precinct. The theme of tonight's debate, Planetary Health, is close to Victoria University's heart. We are committed to the well-being of people, of place and of our planet, recognising that the health of one affects the health of all. Strong communities can make strong choices to be committed custodians for our environment and for our shared home, planet Earth. The students involved tonight develop their own topics from this context, and this is a fantastic example of the Footscray Learning Precinct and Planetary Health Concepts in Action. I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Hi everyone, my name is Jacinta Parsons and I will be guiding you, our online audience and the debaters through tonight's event. You might have heard my voice on ABC Radio Melbourne afternoon show. So I'm really pleased to be here tonight to keep these debaters on track and civil. This is going to be an interesting and engaging evening with five young debaters from Footscray High School ready to tackle complex topics with Sammy Shah. Each student will have the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one debate with Sammy. The debaters get two minutes each for their arguments, a minute and 30 seconds for their rebuttal, and a final 30 seconds each to wrap up their arguments. Once they finish debating, we're going to launch a poll on Facebook for you to vote for who you think has presented the best case overall, students or Sammy Shah. So make sure you're ready to vote. If you need subtitles, please go to the link in the comment box and you can view the event from there with subtitles. We encourage you all to comment and support our debaters, but remember to play nice. Without further ado, let's get stuck into it. I'd like to welcome Sammy Shah to the stage, ready for his first debate. Good evening, Sammy Shah, as you come through the vortex of technology. I hope I'm visible. Am I? Is it working? Is well, it working at the end? I think so. I think All so. Right. We can Let's hear you. So. That should be more than enough. My face isn't uh, never launched a thousand ships. I can assure you. Um, this is so exciting. I haven't I haven't done this since last year. And uh, last year I got quite a thrashing at the hands of the uh, students. And so clearly, like a glut for punishment, I'm back for more. Brilliant. We love you and we're ready uh, to do what we need to do to ensure that you are kept in your place. Are you ready, Sammy Shah? I am indeed. I did drop my notepad just as soon as you said my name. <laughs> so I'm going to dip <laughs> down and pick that up. And there we go. Notepad is picked and now I'm ready. Fantastic. All right. The first topic is raising awareness and scaremongering isn't working. We need to do more to motivate people to be environmental. 
Mason is presenting the affirmative argument on this topic. Now, Mason, he doesn't claim to be a model student, but he does enjoy public speaking and to an extent debating as well. Likely thanks to constantly arguing with his friends and family about pretty much everything. Golf and video games are his two passions though he can assure you that his nan wishes it was things that took up less space, as there are golf clubs in about half the rooms in his house. Without further ado, please welcome Mason. Good evening, Mason. This isn't your first rodeo. You've taken on Sammy Shah before. You have annihilated him in the past. Are you ready for another thrashing? Always, Jacinta. All right. If you're ready, take a deep breath because the debate starts now. The world is dying, burning alive, drowning, and being torn apart all at once as a result of global warming. Renewable energy is on the rise and looks to be the technology of the future, steadily becoming more cost-effective and desirable than its unstable and inconsistent industrial answer. So why is nothing happening? Here in Australia, we are actively moving backwards, not forwards, in regards to our use of non-renewable fuels. But why? Why isn't scaremongering working, and why aren't we getting anywhere? The answer is simple. Fear. Flight, fight, freeze. Now, we can ignore the fighters. They're already taking action. Leagues ahead of the rest of us. Rallying, protesting, expressing their power the best way they know. The rest of us, however, need to be addressed. To do this, we need to change the type of fear people experience. Right now, the current strategies often cause debilitating fear rather than what we're trying to invoke, constructive fear. Debilitating fear causes someone to either be paralyzed in fear or have them run from the problem, whereas constructive fear makes someone act to remove the cause. But is it possible to move people between these two standpoints? Well, yes, of course it is. But it works in a very different way. And it has a lot to do with societal norms. Humans are pack animals by nature. And in your everyday life, you will find that facing an everyday fear is much easier if you have people around you supporting you. What we need to do is follow the fighters, the people there ready to support us. The climate change movement already exists and it is right there waiting for us to join and come support, but that's the problem they're waiting. There are two big pressure points that the fighters are currently not exploiting. The first is their right to vote. The second is using moral leverage to pressure those of a frozen standpoint. Thank you very much, Mason. I just want to say you had me at video games, then you lost me at golf. Um, look, when it comes to fear, we have to understand that the value of debilitating fear is being understated here. Debilitating fear is the greatest form of fear. Anyone who's been to a horror movie, watched something horrific happen on screen and utterly frozen in fright knows that to be true. There's a reason, for example, why the Tyrannosaurus Rex was evolved to not see their prey when the prey froze in fright because a frozen prey is a prey that survives. A prey that runs away is a prey that gets caught. In, using that analogy over here in a very sloppy manner, let me just point out that if everyone was frozen in fear, if everyone was so afraid that they genuinely couldn't even move, there's a very good chance that they might actually be too frozen to contribute to the high carbon emissions, too, fro you know, too frozen in fear to get into their cars, too frozen in fear to travel internationally. As we've seen right now, when it comes to uh, COVID-19, people are too scared to travel suddenly, which means carbon emissions from planes are down. People are too scared to visit their relatives, which means carbon emissions from cars are down. We're not scaring them enough. It's not about the type of fear. It's about the intensity of fear. We want people to be so frightened that they just don't even think of doing anything at all. And that is what will save the planet. We need people to be so scared that anything that they want to do is completely overrun by fear because anything else any other op any other optimism we might give them any hope we might give them people abuse that people cannot be trusted with anything positive 
They always turn it into something terrible. The best way to deal with the masses, I include myself in the masses, is by freezing them with fear. And on that note, I would like to hand over my time. Well, Sammy, I'm sorry, but your argument falls apart at its core. We are no longer in the age of dinosaurs. This is a modern world. Let's take a modern example and apply it to your analogy and see how it holds up. You're face to face with a serial killer. Someone whose face is known. Face to face with them, holding a knife, coming for your life, and you're backed into a corner. What happens if you freeze? You die. That's it. That's the end of the story. So, we must act, and in taking these actions, we must exploit the pressure points to cause societal upheaval. But how do we do that? Well, remember, humans are pack animals. Think back to the Vietnam War protests if you can. 10,000 university students, professors, active adults, pacifists, on the streets of Melbourne. Troops withdrawn, the jig was up, the public won. Back to 2003 when 600,000 Australian citizens marched against the deployment of our troops in Afghanistan, and even the police were afraid of our sheer number. When did we, as Australian citizens, become so apathetic, so uncaring, so lazy, so unwilling? What happened to the will of the Australian people to stand against our government and big business? And so I ask you, Sammy, why can't we do it again? If I may query, in this analogy that you put forth about the serial killer and the victim, are we the serial killer or are we the victim? Because based on our current behavior, I would argue Mother Nature is not the serial killer. Mother Nature is the victim that's frozen in fear. We are the serial killers. And therefore, we need to consider our own actions. Now, the reason why we don't go out and protest anymore, the reason why we don't have 600,000 people marching in the streets across the world or across Melbourne or across any other city in Australia to stop climate action, or we did, but it didn't really have any effect, is because of just that. It doesn't have any effect. Unfortunately, the Vietnam War didn't end because of protests. The Vietnam War ended in the end because the two armies came to Entente. The, the, the uh, Afghanistan invasion happened anyway. It turns out people don't react well when they're told not to do something, when they're told not to do something, when someone's yelling at them. They only react well when they've got no other choice. People only react in the right way when all other choices are taken away from them. So to get people to respect mother nature, to get people to behave in a responsible way when it comes to global warming, we have to frighten them to the point where they feel that they have no other options left. We need Mother Nature to put on her Halloween mask, to grab a knife and chase us down a dark alley. That's the only way we're going to learn a lesson is when we hit that brick wall, turn around and Mother Nature lunges at us. Well then, we'll make protest force change. To sum it all up, we need to exercise the rights that we have in our system to make the systematic change to end climate change. Big business will be forced to supply the population's new demand as demand for renewable energies and sustainable society expands exponentially because of our ever-growing climate change movement. If we can get more and more people, more and more of those people running, of those people freezing, the response of Mother Nature in our now Sorry, my time is up. That's all right, you can finish your sentence. In our now movement, there will be nothing that can stand in our way. Thank you. The one thing that hurts big business more than any other isn't protest. It's silence. It's when you stop taking their brand names. It's when you stop remembering their products. And it's when you stop buying their things. The thing they're most afraid of is being forgotten. And the best way to forget them is by freezing them out with fear, by being so afraid of buying their things that we don't even want to think about them anymore. Hopefully, when we reach that point in our existence, when we are too scared to even buy anything, we're going to see businesses have to reform. <laughs> 
I will let you know that the crowd out there is laughing and cheering. Thank you for that debate, Mason and Sammy. It's now time for our viewers at home to on Facebook to vote for the winner. You're going to see our poll pop up on your screen. Please vote for either Sammy or Mason. Of course, there was multiple moments in that debate where we swung from either side. Were you on Sammy's side when he painted the picture of Mother Nature with a knife coming at you? Or were you on the sensible side of Mason who drove a beautiful argument captured around this idea of constructive fear? And then Sammy Shah brings in these ideas of dinosaurs, he himself being a dinosaur, as Mason quite accurately noted, dinosaurs are over Sammy. I'm going to find out very soon who has won. Was it Mason? or Sammy Sharp, make sure you put your votes in right now as this debate. <laughs> Raising awareness and scaremongering isn't working. We need to do more to motivate people to be environmental. Yes or no, where did we end up? Did you go for Sammy? Did you go for Mason? Did you go for Mother Nature and that strange metaphor we built around serial killers? Well, Somehow we did Even uh, Halloween's on its way. <laughs> are you ready? The results are in. Unsurprisingly, Mason, you have done it again. You have won your debate by 63%. I would say that is resounding. Put your hands up in victory, my friend. Congratulations. Well the done, <laughs> Sammy Shah, are you ready for the next one? I am not, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this so much. I love it when these students take you for a ride. The second topic is the current school system is outdated and should be changed. Stanley is presenting the affirmative argument on this topic. Stanley enjoys reading, playing video games and playing Yu-Gi-Oh! I think that's how you pronounce it. In the future, he hopes the governments realise that they need to help the environment and actually do something to help the future generations. Please welcome your next opponent, Sammy Shah, Stanley. Stanley, are you ready? Have you been doing your push-ups and sit-ups in the, in the waiting room? My brain has, yes. Great. That's all we need, your brain doing what it's required to do. Good luck, Stanley. Good luck, Sammy Shah. And the debate starts now. Is the school system outdated? Well, yes, of course it is. How could a system that was created in the 1600s still work today? I mean, back then they would coat you in mercury and put you in an oven to ward off diseases. So how could a system from 400 years ago still work today? It can't. Student engagement is way down. How can you stay interested in an outdated curriculum where Vikings skied for fun and Pythagoras' theorem are still on the curriculum? Like, gee, it sure will be handy when I'm just casually <laughs> calculating the right-angled hypotenuse of a triangle. Yeah. If surveyed, I'd say that 9 out of 10 kids would say that they don't enjoy learning. That is 1,260 students at my school. Can you imagine if nobody learnt anything? Would disengage you all the time? It would be like Lord of the Flies, chaotic, barbaric, and a really good book premise. The current school system means that students don't absorb the information they're learning and instead get it just to recite it into a, te into a test or presentation. And then afterwards, the information fades and it's deemed useless besides from being a user, it's being able to be used for a good grade or a fun fact for pub trivia. It's not like somebody's going to kill me if I don't tell them how the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Crap, now I've jinxed it. COVID has shown us how the curriculum can be stripped down to the bare bones, teaching us what we need to know and leaving us with time to pursue our own interests. That's why I'm here today, because I was able to pursue my own interests, such as debating. So how can it be that a system that was made, may I remind you, 400 years ago, still work today? Let's not forget about the mercury oven. The school system is outdated and it has to be changed. There's just no way around it. 
Thank you very much, Stanley, for that. Um, well, one of the interesting things is this attitude that because something is old, it must then be thrown out. It must then be retooled. It must then be repurposed. Just because it's old, it doesn't mean it's bad. Sometimes it's old and it's lasted this long because it works. As we've seen, when you buy new consumer goods these days, they fall apart right away. But if you buy something old, it lasts forever. It's the same for the education system. It's lasted this long because it works. You mentioned nine out of 10 students don't enjoy learning. They're not supposed to enjoy learning. Learning is not supposed to be fun. Learning is supposed to be something you have to do. And the reason you have to do it is because it prepares you for life. Being prepared for life isn't fun. Look at me, I'm 43, I'm 42 years old. I almost said 43, why am I aging myself? I'm 42 years old. Everything I learned in school made me miserable and therefore I know now how to deal with misery. If all I was presented with was joyous information and fun facts and things, I would not be the marginal, moderate, mid-level success that I am today. All right. There are things to be learned. There's information to be gleaned. Pythagoras' theorem may sound useless to you right now, but there's a part of your brain that uses Pythagoras' theorem every time you cross the road. It does those mental calculations. And the reason it does them well is because you have been taught how to do them. The important thing to know is that the school system has evolved. It's not exactly the same as it was 400 years ago. Like you said, 400 years ago, they used to put kids in ovens. Um, I'm not sure if that is accurate, but they did beat them with sticks. We don't do that anymore because we realize that that's not a good system. We did teach them that everything can be cured with leeches. We don't teach that anymore. We say antibiotics works a lot better. There's a reason why the education system is where it is today is because it has learned from the lesson of the past and improved almost, nay I say, perfected itself to this point. And the evidence for that is you, Stanley, because you are a subject of the education system as it stands today, and you are exceptional. Well, you say, Chami, that people learn and that it works, the school system, and they're teaching you about why you should use antibiotics and why drugs are okay. Medicinal drugs, not like weed or anything, that's bad. Don't do weed. Don't. Don't. I'm looking at you, don't. So, why do you think anti vaxxers are a thing? Because people haven't been taught in the proper way. Just because it's worked in the past doesn't mean it works now. Sure, some things work, like a phone or a toaster, but most of the things don't. If you give people a horse and a carriage, they're going to say, no, nope, I ain't using that, I'm using my Ford. If you give people leeches, they're going to say, no, I'm taking drugs, because it's way better. Sometimes it's better to get rid of the old stuff and bring in with the new, exactly like a school system. We have changed the school system, but when you put it down to it, it's the exact same as the old. You teach kids about something, you make it not fun, and you tell them, you need to know this, because if you don't, you'll fail at life. Well, maybe you don't have to fail at life if you don't learn, because you should learn, but maybe if you, maybe if you don't learn the stuff you need to know. What you just said now about me being an exceptional student, this is a prime example of how I'm not and how the school system sucks. Stanley, you are an inspiration. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Look, here's the thing, all right? Your focus is on fun, and therein lies the problem, all right? We, and fun is good. Fun is great. I like having fun. Who's anti-fun? There's no one who's anti-fun. But too much fun can be dangerous. I'll give you an example. We are now all overstimulated with our phones, right? We've got the phones that have the apps and the games and the internet and the social media and every single thing streaming into our eyeballs and our brains and we are overstimulated. And that has driven us crazy, which is, it's why we now have anti-vaxxers. It's why we now have people think 5G towers give you COVID. It's because fun has melted our brains. We need discipline. We need organization. We need things like structured classes, structured education, structured learning. We need people to not have fun. We need people to, in fact, get bored. There is a whole world of wonder inside your brains that you will only discover if you are bored. If you are sitting in a classroom with a geography teacher gr droning on about longitude and latitudes, 
and you're sitting there and your mind is turning to mush and you turn inside and you start thinking about dragons and things like that. And the next thing you know, you've written the next book as great as Lord of the Rings. That can only happen if you are in a structured system and you have the discipline to finish that book that you're working on, as opposed to just writing three words, getting distracted by your phone, running off with your friends and having fun. Fun is dangerous. Don't have fun. This is your brain on fun. Well, you say that people should not have fun because then they can use their imagination. But by saying that, you're saying that we should change the school system because it's better if we do. Because that way you can teach kids how to have imaginations and how to learn and how to hold protests, how to do stuff that they want to actually do. Like Scott Morrison is saying that we should stay at school instead of protesting, but protesting has taught us more than school actually ever has. Eventually, everything has to change and everything is outdated. And I See, think yeah, that the yeah, yeah, system Sorry, continue. Okay. Um, look, the reason why you rebel. The reason yeah, yeah. why you create rock and roll, the reason why you write punk rock books that are awesome and fun is because you're escaping the system. You're fighting the system. The school system needs to stay rigid and boring and dull and repetitive because if it isn't, you'll have nothing to rebel against. We get our greatest artists, our greatest thinkers, our greatest minds through rebellion. And rebellion is something they can only have when they have something to rebel against. And therefore, school should remain the way it is so we have a reason to be rebellious. <laughs> so many incredible moments in that debate. I am having the best night. Thank you guys, uh, Stanley and Sammy Shaw for that. It's now time for our viewers at home on Facebook to vote for the winner. You'll see a poll pop up just as you did before with Mason. Please vote for either Sammy or Stanley. Sammy or Stanley. Fantastic. Look, Gee, did we hit the pinnacle of the debate early when Sammy Shah described himself as a marginal, moderate, mid-level success and then Stanley proved himself, well, almost proved uh, Sammy Shah's thesis uh, when he tried to trick you by telling you that you were exceptional and then you proved that you were Stanley. It got confusing there for a little while. So we are in quite a spot with this debate. You Sammy, I don't know if you can Sorry, can, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Do you understand? By voting against me, you are voting against Stanley because the main thesis of my debate was that Stanley is exceptional. By not letting me win, you're saying Stanley is not exceptional and therefore you're being true to Stanley. And I do not promote that. By, kind of by saying that I'm not exceptional, you are therefore proving my point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The people at home have had a very confusing time to work out where to put their votes this evening in terms of supporting the debate. The numbers are being calculated as we speak. This has been a nail-biting finish by the two of you. Who has won the debate? Obviously, we're talking about where the school could be remodelled. We're about to find out whether it was Stanley or Sammy Shah. The winner is... Stanley! By 71% Stanley! Congratulations! <laughs> Throw your hands in the air, do a little robot dance. Congratulations on taking Sammy. Sammy, that's too love, my friend. I feel like next year the debate should just be I stand in a ring and five uh, teenagers <laughs> with baseball bats just beat me senseless because the end result is the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you're putting up a good fight, but I'm sorry, this education system is proving itself to be quite uh, thorough. All right, are you ready for another one? Are you okay? Let's do this. All, All right, right, let's do it. Take a deep breath. The third topic is the Industrial Revolution was a mistake that doomed our planet. We should return to pre-1700s technology to solve this. Dylan is presenting the affirmative argument on this topic. And ironically, Dylan likes video games, but he also likes board games, with the exception of chess. He doesn't like chess. Mm -mm. Unless there's a variant that makes chess 
actually enjoyable. He thinks that musical theatre is amazing and would participate in it if it wasn't for the fact that he can't sing, can't dance or can't act. We'll say to you, Dylan, never let that stop you. Talking is Dylan's only talent and he's going to take the opportunity to do so now, which is why he is in this debate. Please, everybody, welcome Dylan to your lounge room. Hello. Dylan, this is a hard argument for a gamer to be putting forth, but I wish you all the luck, my friend. Yeah, I thought I'd give Sammy an easy win. Well, we'll see how that goes, Dylan. We will indeed. To the two of you, Sammy Shah and Dylan, I wish you both luck. The debate starts now. So climate change is the, one of the biggest crises of the hotel planet. But unlike the other crises that plague us, we're doing absolutely nothing at all to combat it. Take Australia, for example. We're one of the biggest CO2 emitters in the world. Our carbon emissions haven't dropped in the slightest in the past five years, and in fact, they've even gone up. If we continue our current course of action, or more correctly, inaction, we will doom ourselves and this planet to a terrible fate. We are already seeing the earliest consequences of this. The um, bushfires in New South Wales earlier this year are just one of the many disasters that are going to plague our world. Yet there is one root cause of CO2 being emitted by our country and all the other countries in the world technology. Back in the late 17th century, the steam engine was invented and was used to kickstart the Industrial Revolution. The technologies that were made during this time have paved the way for our modern world, but have also paved the way for our destruction. Humans as a species have existed for more than 10,000 years, but only in the past 300 have we grown to rely on technology that will kill us all. Technology, oh, sorry, but technology is not, um, but not all technology is harming our planet. Humans have made all sorts of useful things, Compasses to help navigate, windmills and water mills to help grind grain. We have understood irrigation for millennia. And these simple tools are what help to keep us alive. Now our current technology is the reason for our deaths. These old technologies work, and as I'm sure Sammy will agree, we should go back to old technologies that work and keep them the same. Technologies that don't threaten all life on Earth. And I say we return to what works and what keeps us alive. We need to save the planet and save ourselves. We are currently doing next to nothing to combat climate change. But if we abandon the technology for, that the Industrial Revolution has given us, our emissions and ecological footprint will drop to a minuscule fraction of what it is now. Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, I'm enjoying this debate so much. It's so much fun to be able to sit here in my living room with my laptop, streaming this debate through the camera on my laptop using high fiber internet. Um, as such as it is here in Australia, and being able to see you face to face, even though you are miles and miles away from me during lockdown. Now, 400 years ago, were we to have this exact same debate, I would be in my hut, you would be in your hut, um, you would be staring at the wall, I would be staring at the fireplace, we would be talking largely to ourselves with no audiences, oh, and most likely already be dead because of smallpox, polio, or any of the other plagues that rampantly ran through the area all the time. The reason why we have technology today is because technology has saved mankind. Technology has made our lives better. Yes, there has been a downside, but that downside should not be blamed on technology. You don't blame the tool, you blame the tool user. So you don't blame me if I hit you with that. You don't blame the hammer if I hit you with a hammer. You blame the, ha uh, wait, let me do that again. You don't blame the hammer if I hit you with the hammer. You blame me for hitting you with the hammer. I spent too much time on hitting you with hammers. I'm going to move on right now. One of the important things to know about why we are where we are right now in terms of climate change is that we aren't actually as badly off as we could have been. What happened was the world started having extreme climate change and extreme carbon emissions 900 years ago, 800 years ago. But the Mongols swept through all of Asia and Europe, killed millions and millions of people, and led to 700 million carbon tons of emission being, re being cleaned from the atmosphere because of regrowth and reforestation. So would your argument then be that mass murder through the Mongols is the solution to the problem? No. The solution to the problem is responsible use of technology and responsible use of the environment. Once we do that, we deserve to live in the world we live in. Until then, yes, we have to be more careful, but regressing isn't the answer. I, I hate to break it to you, Sammy, but like as much as medicine has saved a lot of our lives, like this technology is gonna kill everyone. If we just even if we abandon technology, that's gonna kill so few or less people. 
than allowing climate change to just destroy our planet. Technology has morally ruined humanity. How can we possibly think that it's okay to continue burning coal when it will ruin life for everything else that we coexist with? We've been conditioned to think that what we're doing is normal, it's just our way of life. But humans are incredibly unnatural. A common trope in fantasy, in fantasy genres is a forbidden dark magic which unlocks great power but at a terrible cost to the user. Our society has tapped into this dark magic using fossil fuels to achieve our position in the world and the food chain. And it's us that are going to pay the price. And we're paying the price now. Um, right. So, like, technology might be able to help us solve climate change in, in a bit. But, like, we're still making those technologies. We've been waiting for them, for technology to solve the problem it's created for decades now. Scientists have known about it for even longer than that. When is this technology that's going to save us arrive? It's not going to happen. We need to just abandon that project and go back to the start. Abandoning projects and going back to the start has never been the human way, though. Humans have always moved forward. If we had abandoned the project and gone back to the start, for example, I wouldn't be able to see right now. The reason why I can see is because I have spectacles on my face. And the spectacles exist because technology allowed the creation of spectacles. And it allowed people to go, you know what? Let's not have people falling off cliffs and stumbling into walls all the time. Let's put something on their face that allows them to see. Now, I bear your argument that yes, technology is not doing uh, wonders for the next generation. A selfish person might say something along the lines of, well, that's the next generation's problem. My life is pretty great. I've got high speed internet. I've got great video games. I just finished Ghost of Tsushima on my PlayStation 4. Life is fantastic. Let the next generation worry about that. Like anyone else, let them fix the problem the way we've fixed our problems so far. But I won't say that. What I will say is this. Have faith in human imagination. Have faith in human endeavor and in human impetus. because we have gotten this far and we will develop the technology to get us further. Now, maybe that means we have to abandon the planet and move to another planet after this one's unlivable. But regardless, that would be an achievement. More likely, though, it means you're going to come up with something cool, something awesome, something that you can use by just clicking a, phone, a button on your phone and it's going to clean the atmosphere, make all our lives better. I look forward to that day because I believe in the future. But you're forgetting the fact that hu uncontrolled human imagination is what got us into the problem in the first place. Nearly all the problems that are being faced by humanity, climate change, nuclear Armageddon, they're all made by, they're all man-made problems. We invented all of them using our imagination. Like, these weren't a thing before we just allowed technology to control our lives. And you're right, yes, life is a lot more comfortable and better now that we have, like, Netflix and TVs and can have this debate um, face to face. But I just want to ask you, Sammy, is your comfort really worth the destruction of humanity? See, here's the thing, though. Even if we end up going back, let's say we agree with you and we end up going back to the 1700s. The problem is there's always going to be that one person. There's always going to be that one intrepid mind, that one scientific curiosity out there who's going to go, I wonder what happens if we start using steam to power things. Then there'd be another one who goes, I wonder what will happen if we start using electricity to power things. And there'd be another one who'll steal the second one's patent and turn it into a better business, a la Edison. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, we're back where we started. So as opposed to just redoing the next 300, the last 300 years again and again and again in an endless loop, Let's just keep moving forward. Who knows where it'll lead? Well, that was one of the more confusing debates, Dylan, because you took on one of the hardest affirmative stances, but mm -hmm. you made beautiful points we'll go over in a moment. Thank you so much to the two of you, Sammy Shah and Dylan, for that debate. It's time for our viewers at home to push the button. Vote with your finger for the winner that you feel like took out that debate then. What you'll see is a poll, as you have for the last ones, pop up on the screen. Bang, hit it. Congratulations to the two of you. Dylan, I'm blown away at your capacity to well, wage an argument that I'm not sure entirely that you believe in. But the beauty of your uh, imagery around dark magic and fossil fuels was incredible. And as Sammy Char trying to trick us 
into saying that the human race isn't good at abandoning projects. Well, Sammy Shah, you are the exemplar of abandoning projects in your you life. Understand. My last, just the last debate I did, I said humans are terrible. Now I'm saying humans are great. I will say whatever it takes to win. And that's why I am worthy of winning. And Dylan, I, uh, you know, to it, come out of your mouth, uncontrolled human imagination is our problem, was compelling and incredible. And I think in some way, the fact that you've twisted this the way you have may see you just get ahead of Sami Shah in this debate. We will find out in just a moment who won the debate. And in the most interesting uh, uh, example of topic today, this one was looking at the Industrial Revolution was a mistake that doomed our planet. We should return to pre-1700s technology to solve this. It was a close one, but the winner is Dylan with 55%. Thumbs up. Uh, All I'll see round. you on the stage. Congratulations, Dylan. Does it feel good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels all right. You had a give me a real run for your money. Run for my money. <laughs> I love that moderate feeling inside you, Dylan. That's going to propel you a long way. Thank you very much and congratulations. It's time for our fourth debate, Sammy Shah. That one was a beauty. I'm loving oh, the dynamic I'm of this. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing very well, Sammy Shah, against all odds, I have to say. This is hard. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm having a great time watching. Thank you. And thank you for, to everyone who's joining us at home this evening. It means a lot to all of us that you're here with us. All right, I'm shaking it off. The fourth topic is Australia needs to improve how toxic waste is managed. Marley is presenting the affirmative argument on this topic. Marley is a grade nine and his interests include theatre, comedy and playing guitar. A little bit like someone else I know, Sammy Shah. Please welcome Marley. Uh, Marley, I wonder if your similarities to Sammy Shah will begin and end there. We'll find out. Good luck, my friend. Thank you. Marley, Sammy Shah, the debate starts now. Australia needs to improve how toxic waste is managed. Currently, it is quite unclear where contaminated soil and land is located, and this can have terrible effects on our health. Toxic waste sites need to be more clearly marked, and this would let people know how many there are and where they are located. There should be public notice where factories that contained hazardous materials used to be, so that people know that that area could be contaminated. There should be a larger effort to test soil in people's backyards to make sure that it's safe to be planting in, and there needs to be a better cleanup plan before sites that used to be factories or waste dumps are converted into things like housing and schools. One idea is to do more routine checks to see if factories are storing or manufacturing materials that are considered hazardous. So we know exactly what is being stored and how it could affect soil and other surroundings. If we move towards more renewable and recyclable materials, it will lower the amount of toxic waste in our environment drastically. If we do still have toxic waste, then we can dispose of it sustainably and transparently instead of finding cheaper solutions that have negative effects on our health and our planet. We should better educate people about what the effects of toxic waste on our environment are then it will create awareness around the issue. It's all very well to say that we don't need to deal with it now because everything is currently under control, but we can see the effects toxic waste is having now. And if we keep going at this rate, things will be a lot worse in just a few years. Sustainable disposal of waste isn't something that can be left any longer. In the past, we have buried the problem so that we could deal with it in the future. But the future is now, and we can't keep covering it up. We have to find solutions. There we go. Thank you very much for that, Marley. Um, look, here's the thing. You have to understand, not knowing where the toxic waste is 
is exciting. It makes life unpredictable. Who knows what will happen? Who knows where you'll get radioactivity, po radioactive poisoning? Who knows where the next Ninja Turtles might come from? Who knows how the next group of X-Men are created? We would live in a far more exciting world if you did not know where the next bout of toxic waste was going to be and how it might affect people. Do you think Spider-Man was created by knowing that the spider was radioactive? No, he didn't know the spider was radioactive. None of the students it was really active and we got a great superhero out of that if you are against superheroes Mali, then my heart breaks for you because the world without superheroes is a world not worth living in the important thing to know is that radioactivity can be anywhere all right we've got toxic waste all over the place and look at us wasting around right now who knows what benefits we're getting perhaps maybe toxic waste acts like uh, small incremental doses of poison you know if you take when and you want to become a, you want to develop a good anti-venom you take small doses of venom and that makes you more resilient to a large dosage of venom maybe that works the same way not knowing that the soil that my tomatoes are growing in is radioactive is actually making me anti-radioactive who knows because we have not yet spent enough time reaping the benefits of this toxic wasteland that we live in and one other thing that we should always keep in mind is that australia is a beautiful land it is an amazing land it is a land that we want Want to protect. Let's say World War III happens and foreign armies try to invade Australia. If our soil is toxic and our people are mutated with awesome superpowers, no one's going to invade us. Why do you hate superheroes, Mali? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Well, as much as I love superheroes or Ninja Turtles and, you know, not knowing what's going to happen next, I spoke to a healthcare worker who listed the problems toxic waste causes, such as respiratory problems and an increase of patients, which can have a drastic effect on our economy. And one example of something that was unknown was the West Footscray fire, which happened in a factory where they were storing chemicals illegally. And what happened there was, well, we know what happened there, and uh, that had bad effects on the community. It had bad effects people on people's health. It had bad effects on the economy and it had bad effects on the firefighters that went there. One Another example is the Westgate Tunnel, which was halting production, which had terrible effects on the economy because people who were, say, contract workers who were working there, they're now out of a job because the soil was contaminated. Now, if you think that that's what the unknown is and looking into the unknown, the uncertainty of whether we are going to be alive in the future, the uncertainty of whether we are going to have a job, we are in a pandemic right now. Wouldn't you have preferred if we could predict this in the future and then we could, you know, work out, have time to plan everything? Well, something similar could happen with toxic waste. We need to make a change now and think about the future now instead of waiting until the unknown becomes reality. We need jobs. We're in a market right now where people just don't have jobs. Jobs are in scarcity. You've got up to 60 people applying for the same job. If there's enough toxic waste around, there's going to cause enough problems that we'll have all kinds of jobs. We'll have people having to put out the fires. We'll have people having to heal the sick. We'll have people having to save the environment. Jobs all around. The reason why we have toxic waste randomly put all over the environment is not because we are negligent. It's because we're thinking of the children. We want the children of the future to have jobs and employment and a future in which they have something worth fighting for, damn it. And what better thing to fight for than the environment, than for your health, than and for your safety. How will you appreciate the good things in life if you're not confronted with the bad? And when Godzilla rises up from the earth because of the toxic waste in the soil, having irradiated a small iguana into a giant lizard, all the people who will band together and fight Godzilla, they will be grateful for that moment of unity. Otherwise, we just start fighting with each other. We, we need a common enemy. Toxic waste and the irresponsible usage of it is providing us with that common enemy. And that's one thing that we should say th th thank you to Toxic Waste for. Well, I would say that it actually does put people sort of out of a job because if you are developing a property somewhere and you are unaware of the toxic waste in the soil, 
then it can have drastic effects on the economy because the amount of money you would need to fix up that property, the amount of money you would need to safely remove what was there, the amount of money and the amount of people who will lose their jobs because they were originally working on that site and now cannot, that I think outweighs the what's going to happen in the future, what's the unknown. And as much as I love Godzilla, I would love it if we knew when Godzilla was going to appear. Look, given the fact that I ha actually have no good points left to hit you with at all, I'm just going to go back to the only point I made that actually have worked in my favor a little bit, which is we need Spider-Man. Spider-Man needs to exist. We need the Ninja Turtles, and they will only happen if we have toxic waste spilling into all kinds of places. Pour it down your gutters. Put it on your spiders. Let humans become the next super level of our evolution, because this level of evolution, to be frank, is quite boring. Molly, on behalf of Australia, I would like to apologize to you for having to argue with a man who wanted to make toxic spiders the center argument. It's not okay. Look, Molly, in my defense. <laughs> The first draft of this speech had me defending toxic masculinity because that's the only other thing I could think of that was toxic, all right? This is the second draft. All right, I'm doing the best I can. Marley, you were inspiring. Basically, I think it was a knockout. When Sammy Shah comes back on and says, I have nothing else but to repeat my toxic... When he starts an argument with not knowing where toxic waste is, is exciting... I don't know where we go to. You know what you need to do, people. You need to use your finger to this guy. It's not mutated. It's a finger. Put it on a name and vote with your heart and with your mind this evening. Tell us who you think won that debate today, Sam, Sammy Shah or Marley. Marley, I mean, when you were confronted with some of those arguments that just kept coming at you, you were very composed. Was there some meditative breathing going on? How did you cope? Well, I, I think I just love superheroes. That was the only option. <laughs> Do you know what? A I really good point came um, through. What would happen if Godzilla um, really did come about? <laughs> A really good point came through uh, the Facebook page as you're watching the comments streaming in and uh, a very good argument. Sounds like Marley was looking after the ordinary person, the real superhero. Now, if that's not just an absolute knockout, I don't know what is. We're waiting for those votes to be calculated. I don't know if this one's going to be. <laughs> it's not close. I just want to preface that, Sammy Shah. It's not close. Hold yourself. The winner tonight is Marley by a very convincing 95%. Marley, wow. I think you need to go home. You get ice cream with some chocolate sauce on it this evening. Congratulations. Arms in the air, Marley. You did it. You leave the debate a winner, possibly a hero, and you might need danger money if you're ever asked to debate Sammy Shah again. Congratulations. Yeah. Sammy Shah. I mean, really, mate. Yeah. Uh, we've so, got one okay, more so debate. Here's the thing. All right, I don't get to choose the topic, so I sound like a maniac whenever I'm defending these things. <laughs> that said, it's... Even harder when they're as good as they are because their arguments are so well made out, their points are so well made, and they're so articulate. But I just, and I basically they, when you try and throw them off with ridiculous perspectives, they've stayed clear. All right, <laughs> we're up for our very last topic, it's the fifth and final topic. It is every citizen should receive a free bike. Alex is presenting the affirmative argument on this topic. Alex enjoys going on walks. I'm assuming Alex also enjoys riding bikes, drawing with her friends and looking fabulous. She also enjoys debating and obviously public speaking. Please welcome Alex. Alex, did you ride your bike to school today? Indeed. All right. If we're ready, the debate starts.
every citizen in Australia should be able to receive a free bike. First of all, there'll be way less pollution. Cars create 17% of pollution of carbon emissions in Australia. This needs to be decreased. Giving everyone a bike would be a simple fix because bikes don't emit carbon. Second of all, it'd be fantastic exercise for everybody. People could become healthier and fitter by using, by replacing their transport time with in a car to transport time with a bike. Third of all, the government should be would be forced to build way more infrastructure for bikes. There'd be cyclist roads and a lot less highways, which take up a lot of space, which could be used for bike lanes or beautiful parks. And who doesn't want a park? Fourth of all, it creates a community, a culture. Cars both physically isolate you because you're in a box and also isolate people from which car they have. But if everyone has a bike, it's a communal way of looking at life. Everyone is together. It can create a culture of repair. And once everyone's in that community, they can group together and look at bigger things like planetary health. This a bike Giving every citizen the opportunity to a free bike may seem a bit ridiculous, but if you think about it in a little bit of detail, go forward, there aren't really many faults with the plan. Everyone gets a free bike and there are so many benefits. Everyone, everyone can become a, oh, sorry, you can go. All right, I'll, I'll start. Um, one of the greatest problems that we have discovered as bicycles have increased in our environment are men in Lycra. They are a pest, they are an eyesore, and some would argue they are actually a menace. Why do we want more of that? Why do we want to see more grown middle-aged men in tight-fitting, body-hugging Lycra? It is absolutely not something that anyone wants to see an increase in and frankly i'm a bit worried for those who argue in favor of it now bicyclists are how can i put this gently pests and the reason why they're pests is because they ride on the footpath they ride helter skelter all over the roads they will enter your parks and they will they are genuinely the bees of the motorway all right they will go where they are not welcome there is no respect for other people's personal space when you're a bicyclist they don't even often ring the bell when they're coming up behind you just letting you be frightened out of your wits as a bicyclist a usually a man in lycra zooms past you now one of the important things we have to remember is that not everybody is of bicycling age right you've got elderly relatives you've got gran who's living let's say out in reservoir how is gran going to visit her grandchildren in brunswick if she lives in reservoir and she used to ride the bike all the way who can are we just going back to the day when you used to go to visit your relatives and it would take a three-day trip to visit them and a three-day trip to come back no we are a progressive society so we need cars we need to be able to travel fast we need to be able to move at an incredible speed the bicycle is a great hobby let it remain a hobby we cannot be trusted with that kind of in uh, a weapon one might say because we might hurt people we might hurt ourselves and we'll definitely hurt the sensibilities of gentle people with more lycra all right although it can be frightening to see middle-aged men in lycra as you mentioned before sammy can't we use our human imagination to find a great new compromise to this um, fashionable, extremely fashionable cyclist wear? And this debate is not about taking away cars. It's about giving the people the opportunity to have a bike. You don't have to have one if you don't believe that you're right, but you have the option to have a bike. You can still use your car, Obviously, there's a time and a place for a car. You can use it whenever you'd like, but you have the added option of cycling. Cycling 
with a bike that you got for free. And you mentioned that it's more challenging because cyclists go through parks, they go on footpaths, which can be annoying, but with more infrastructure and education, which will be imposed on the general public as more people ride, cyclists and the cyclists and the general community and pedestrians will become a more combined culture as everyone will be able to understand each other. The current system of having only cars is flawed. Giving everyone cycle, giving everyone bikes gives so many benefits, even though men in Lycra are scary. Here's the thing though. We've already been down this road. We've already ridden on this path, if you'll pardon the pun. We were given lots of bikes. They weren't free, but anyone who wanted a bike could have one. If you remember the great O-Bike disaster of 2018, 2019. That's right, an organization came to Melbourne and gifted bikes to all of us. They bestowed bikes upon the city of Melbourne. And what did we do? Did we take those bikes and go riding down footpaths or on bike lanes? And did we improve our health? Did we, did we, did we enjoy the wind rushing through our hair as we biked through the city of Melbourne? No, we threw it in the river. We created uh, uh, modern art sculptures out of it. We put them up in trees. We abandoned them all over the city. We filled landfill with old bikes. And the lesson there was that we cannot be trusted with bicycles. They're too easily turned into a menace because in our hearts, as Melbournians, we love mischief. And nothing says mischief like taking a bicycle and apparently putting it into the river. That is just something that we have within us. It's a deep primal cry for help, perhaps. But regardless, it's something that we did. And then what were we left with? Just men in Lycra walking around the city because they no longer had bikes anywhere. Would you like your teachers to come to school in Lycra? Would you like a co-worker in the office to wear, be wearing Lycra? No, I say this for everyone. Bikes should be banned. The problem with O-Bikes is that it wasn't a personal bike. It was a communal bike. No one wants to sit on a sweaty bike that some old men on life have sat on. Besides, didn't it, did it not put a smile on everyone's face to see an O-Bike in a tree? In conclusion, giving everyone a free, personal bike benefits the entire community. Environmentally, through for everyone's personal health, Safe, make everything safer, and create a beautiful sense of community and culture within Melbourne to add to our of mystery. The question is, who will give those bikes? Because if we give it to the government, and we tell the government, hey, your job is to distribute bikes, they're going to make a mess of it. They can't be trusted with that level of responsibility. Adults will be getting children's bike. Children will be getting adults' bike. People will be getting vintage bikes when they want a speed bike and a speed bike when they want a vintage bike. And all we're going to be forced to do then is put that bike up a tree and down a river. Because that, in the end, is where a bike belongs. <laughs> it's very hard for me to enter these moments on lines like that, Samantha. Alex, yet again, another incredibly well executed argument. It's your turn, people, to vote for who you thought won that debate. Was it Sammy Shah or was it the wonderful, compelling Alex who told us about the connectivity of bikes, how bikes are good for our health and good for our community? Or are you going to go for Sammy Shah, who shamed 50% of our population in the way that they ride their bikes? Um, well, can I see say that when he comes into the ABD office in his Lycra. No one needs that. I am trying to save the world from more wrath scenes. Look, Alex, I just think that your arguments around bike riding were wonderful. I thought Sam had you there for a moment when he brought up the old bike and our memories of how we threw them up trees and over light poles. But you said, no, this is about the personal. This is about us and our hearts. And I think for sure that Sammy may have cost the debate when he held his hand against his heart and tried to find a white word for cyclists and he said pests. That's not going to go very well with this audience, Sammy Shah. Also, 
that you said bicycling for the whole uh, debate, Sammy Shah. Cycling, Sammy. It's that simple. You could have listened to Alex taken a few tips. <laughs> from <laughs> We're about to Didn't find out who won the last round of our debate. I'm almost sad to find out the result because it will mean the end of this wonderful evening where Sammy Shah has yet been humbled by the students <laughs> of Footscray High. And again, Sammy Shah, I would say trouncing. I would say without refute. Alex is the winner of the debate. Hands in the air, Alex. You have won by a resounding 72%. Congratulations. Any final words for the win? Um, not really. That's what we want from you, just a bit of humility on this evening. Congratulations, Alex. That's incredible. And Sammy Shah, I mean, how do you, <laughs> what happens tonight? Do you go? Do you clean um, them up? I'll probably listen to what Daniel Andrews had said earlier, and instead of getting on the beers, I'll reach for something <laughs> on the higher shelf. <laughs> just to I drown out the smoke. Just a Look, bit of this, internal reflection. Yeah, but also you have to keep in mind, this has been the most conversation, the most socializing I have done in <laughs> eight months. I'm not going to sleep tonight because of the sheer energy buzz I'm getting off of it right now. I'm going to have to go for a run around the city just to calm down. <laughs> well, you can go 25k run now if you want yes. to. The steel ring is still around you, Sammy Shah, but not around our hearts. What a wonderful evening. That was seriously the best night I've had in a really long time. You're still wearing a tiny shirt. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank Victoria University, Maribyrnong City Council for producing this event yet again. And a huge thank you to Footscray High School for being involved. Those incredible students with hearts of gold, minds of steel, they were an absolute treat this evening. It's been an extremely challenging year for schools, for their students, for their teachers and parents, and your passion and enthusiasm for being involved has been greatly appreciated. A huge thank you to you as well for joining us this evening, and hopefully we'll get to school him again next year. Thank you and good night.